People don't realize Canada has been very rough in the United States. Everyone thinks of Canada as being wonderful, and so do I. I love Canada. But they've outsmarted our politicians for many years. Good evening, I'm Diana Swain, and this is The National. The U.S. slaps new taxes on Canadian softwood lumber. There inevitably will be job losses. But Ottawa and the provinces say they're ready for battle. We are not going to give up this fight until it is won. She survived an arson attack, but a battle with her insurance company was nearly too much to bear. Very hard. Plus, answering Becca's call. I'm going to donate uh, $200. We are donating $200. And I did this because Becca told me to. The incredible movement started by a dying team. It's a lot easier to teach kindness than it is to teach hate. Canada's softwood lumber is facing some significant new tariffs tonight, effective immediately. And if you feel like you've seen this movie before, you're right. Softwood lumber is a long-standing and contentious issue between the U.S. and Canada that's erupted into all-out dispute four times since the 1980s because the stakes are so high. Softwood lumber is a huge industry here, responsible for nearly 400,000 jobs. Most softwood lumber in Canada is grown on crown land, managed and priced by each province. The U.S. claims Canadian softwood is unfairly subsidized, resulting in cheap lumber being dumped on the U.S. market. So it says it should be subject to tariffs. In real dollars, that's about $1 billion per year, a huge cost to Canadian producers that the government says will cost jobs. We'll hear directly from Canadian softwood producers in just a moment, but we begin with Katie Simpson. We had a very busy day. The president's busy day, day included well. firing well. another shot in the seemingly never-ending lumber dispute. Canada has been very rough in the United States. Everyone thinks of Canada as being wonderful, and so do I. I love Canada. But they've outsmarted our politicians. Trump's top trade official also piled on while trying to calm fears about a possible trade war with Canada. They're generally a good neighbor. That doesn't mean they don't have to play by the rules. Things like this, I don't regard as being a good neighbor dumping lumber. The public airing of frustration no doubt offered much to talk about privately. The Prime Minister held a call with Canada's premiers, and late today, Justin Trudeau also spoke with the U.S. President. Earlier in the day, Trudeau made his position clear. Look, standing up for Canada's interests is what my job is, whether it's soft wood or software. Uh, and... <laughs> But the natural resources minister was more grim. There inevitably will be job losses. And we will focus our efforts on doing whatever we can to ease the impact. Ottawa isn't offering any new financial assistance to lumber producers at this point. But it has asked its federal provincial task force on softwood to look into the issue. Canada is expected to use all legal avenues to challenge the tariffs, but that process could take months. In the meantime, the Foreign Affairs Minister used U.S. television to make Canada's case. The losers in the softwood lumber dispute are middle-class Americans who want to buy an affordable home. The U.S. can't meet its own lumber demands, and it relies on Canadian exports to provide about 30 percent of its needs. The opposition wants the Liberals to amplify that message, while also doing more to publicly defend Canadian interests. You know, when you're dealing with a bully, at some point you've got to stop backing up. Any thickening of the border with the U.S. and Canada doesn't just hurt Canada, it hurts American companies, it hurts American consumers. The cross-border bickering is providing some insight into what the Americans may want with NAFTA. The U.S. Commerce Secretary said one of the problems with the free trade agreement is that lumber and dairy aren't included. So the tweaks Trump was calling for earlier this year may be much larger in scope. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. As we mentioned earlier, the tariffs will add up to about a billion dollars a year for Canadian softwood exporters, and frontline workers in the forests and the mills know that puts their jobs at risk. Greg Rasmussen has that part of the story. For now, the conveyors keep rolling, but this BC mill is just one of hundreds across the country that will take a hit from today's decision. And who do people blame for this? Trump. Workers such as Vicky Sharma know their livelihoods are tied to politics far beyond their control. 
With a wife on maternity leave and two young kids, he's suddenly worried. If I lost my job, so like how can I survive? It's, it's hard to survive here. Those fears are rippling through the entire industry. This exporter ships about $20 million worth of lumber to the United States every year. We're very worried. We're trying to figure out where we stand, what to do moving forward. Um, it's greatly going to impact our business. Some of the duties will be retroactive, meaning he will have to pay back taxes on lumber already sold into the U.S. This decades-old fight comes down to allegations Canadian provinces sell timber rights far below market value. Most of this lumber comes from trees grown on land owned by the government. The U.S. claims Canada unfairly underprices that timber. Canadian lumber exporters say that argument is nonsense. These duties are unwarranted and this determination is completely without merit. But valid or not, international trade disputes can grind on for years. Quebec and the maritime provinces are seen as particularly vulnerable. It could take months, if not years, to have a final resolution. Uh, and that's what's worrisome. Nice to meet yeah. you. BC Liberal leader Christy Clark, in the middle of a jobs-focused election campaign, says export markets such as China are increasingly important. It is our hope that one day we will have our, our markets will be so diversified that we don't need another softwood deal with the United States. But that's a long way off for Al Fortune, whose company is nearly 100% dependent on U.S. markets. Hopefully Canada will now sit down and negotiate with the U.S. and come up with some fair deal that all companies can live with. But for now, uncertainty? For now, it's uncertain. This is just the first slap at Canadian lumber. Additional tariffs under anti-dumping provisions are also in the works, meaning more pain for Canadian lumber companies and their workers. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Maple Ridge, B.C. Earlier this month, a CBC News investigation revealed a disturbing reality. Insurance companies have been denying coverage to victims of domestic violence because of an exemption clause that exists in some provinces. After our story aired, we learned of another shocking case about an Ontario woman who suffered, took her insurance company to court and lost. But now there's a glimmer of hope for her and others in a similar situation. Just before their 32nd wedding anniversary, Wendy Sochik noticed her husband, Jan, was struggling with mental illness. Before she could get him help, he set their house on fire by dousing her with gasoline. Eyes, everything, nose, fire, ear, this side. Your lips? He <clears throat> lips, everything. He put in on here, and I lucky him. God, he gave me second life. Her husband was convicted of attempted murder, but 30 surgeries and six and a half years later, Sochek is still fighting with her insurance company. Allstate refused to repair her home because one of the policyholders intentionally set the fire, no matter that it was domestic violence. I paid insurance, how insurance? So much money, from what? From nothing. Her case mirrors a story we brought you earlier this month. Yep, this is it. Terry Lynn Robison's husband set fire to their home when she asked for a divorce. Allstate refused to pay out. Several provinces have passed laws forcing insurance companies to pay in cases like these. Ontario isn't one of them. This Ontario MPP will introduce a private member's bill tomorrow to get the law changed. I was so appalled and I brought it to the attention of other ministers and said, listen, we've got to do something. Sochek took Allstate to court and last week a judge ruled in the company's favour, saying it was technically within its rights. But he wrote, this case graphically illustrates the compounding of injuries which Allstate's policy imposes on victims of domestic violence. Sochek's lawyer says he's had about half a dozen cases like this with various insurance companies. It's a principle of insurance law that you can't benefit from your own crime. That makes sense. But for an innocent person not to get paid makes no sense at all. Sochek says Allstate's decision to deny her suggests she's somehow to blame for what happened. I wanted, you know, somebody take my pain and see how I feel it. Nobody changed my life. What is damage? Nobody.
very hard. In an email to CBC News, Allstate defends the clause as one that's been around for decades, but adds it has recently come to light that this exclusion has had unintended consequences, specifically to victims of domestic violence. The company says it's reviewing its practices, including Robison's case, and this afternoon, Allstate reached out to Sochek's lawyer with a settlement offer. One more note on this story. Even in provinces where insurance companies are forced to pay out in cases like this, victims are only entitled to half the value because the policy is held by both partners. Coming up, why cutting out saturated fats may be bad for your health. We've really got this wrong and we need to correct it quite quickly. Plus, our latest Viewpoint contributor with her take on the Prime Minister's commitment to help women in the workplace. Is it just an empty promise? It's becoming one of the rallying cries among marijuana users. Stop charging people for possession of a substance that's going to be legal soon and erase past convictions. For the first time, the Prime Minister seemed to open the door to the idea, but how would that work? Catherine Cullen takes a closer look. Hey. Hi, Mr. Prime Minister. Hello, Molly. Um, about a year ago, I was charged with marijuana possession. And uh, if convicted, I'm really afraid that I won't be able to travel to my other countries to see my family. Faced with uh, a situation like that, this, the Prime Minister acknowledges there's a problem. It's unfair uh, that uh, some people are much more likely to get arrested for pot possession, uh, particularly from minority communities. That's wrong. But he says the law stands until legalization takes effect. After that, though, he might help people like Malik. Uh, we will uh, start a process where we try and look at how we're going to make things fairer for, for those folks uh, and for you. It was a really mushy statement. Lawyer Michael Spratt is already taking on the federal government in a case dealing with the rules around pardons. And he says pardons for the hundreds of thousands of people with records for possession would be a good place to start. But not easy. Reviewing all past cases to see if they're appropriate uh, for, for pardoning or not is going to be a massive undertaking. In fact, if the Prime Minister is considering a move like that, it would be extraordinary. From a legal point of view, he has absolutely no obligation to do so. And it's unprecedented historically that I've never been aware of a government entertaining thousands of pardons from people who've been convicted of offenses that are no longer in the criminal code. But is the government really considering it? It is possible, and the Prime Minister has been very clear, that's something that he is prepared to consider at the appropriate time, and the appropriate time is after we've done the important work of introducing and passing this legislation. Though the NDP say it would make more sense to stop charging people now. So we're still going to be prosecuting tens of thousands of young and racialized Canadians for personal use of marijuana while we're legalizing? And then after, magically, we're going to try dealing with those. So pardons are at best a possibility. And even if they do go ahead with it, it's not clear who would be affected or how far back the government would be willing to go. Clearly, they don't really want to talk about it right now, since the message for the time being is that marijuana is still illegal. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. A new report warns the Arctic is warming faster than expected with serious consequences. Written by over 90 scientists, the report says Arctic temperatures are rising twice as fast as in the rest of the world. Last fall, mean temperatures were six degrees higher than average. That means the Arctic Ocean could be ice-free by 2030, if not sooner, putting pressure on species that rely on ice, like polar bears, walruses, and seals. Also troubling, melting permafrost could release dangerous amounts of methane into the atmosphere. North Koreans paid tribute to their nation's martial prowess today with a bold display of military muscle, even as the forces of a vastly stronger country start to mass nearby. An American show of force warning Kim Jong-un to back down from his nuclear program. Kim is nothing if not defiant, but so is Donald Trump. Stephen D'Souza reports. In a region on edge, the scene on the streets of Pyongyang was remarkably serene. Today was a day of celebration in North Korea as the country marked the 85th anniversary of the founding of its military. Many were bracing for a massive show of force to mark Army Day. A nuclear test or intercontinental missile test was expected, but neither of those happened. 
Instead, South Korea says the North conducted a live fire exercise, reportedly with more than 400 artillery pieces. The U.S. response, a military display of its own. The USS Carl Vinson and its group arrived in the region, and the heavily armed USS Michigan docked at the South Korean port of Busan. Officials called this a routine, pre-planned visit in an area where military movement is anything but routine. The U.S. moves drew sharp condemnation from North Korea. Now that the U.S. has pulled out its sword to kill us, we will also pull out our grand sword of justice and fight till the end, a North Korean newscaster proclaims. In Washington yesterday, the president called on other countries, particularly China, to exert their influence. This is a real threat to the world, whether we want to talk about it or not. North Korea is a big world problem. And it's a problem we have to finally solve. The threat is more acute now because the North's weapons have become more powerful and farther reaching. And in the four years of Kim Jong-un's reign, the military has tested more than twice as many missiles as his father did in 17 years. That's a situation more than 100 U.S. senators will get briefed on at a rare White House meeting tomorrow. Obviously, the more that we can solve, it, solve this diplomatically and continue to apply pressure on China, uh, and other countries to use the political and economic tools that they have to achieve uh, a goal in stabilization in the region. That diplomatic pressure continues on Friday. That's when Secretary of State Rex Tillerson chairs a special UN Security Council meeting. The message that when it comes to sanctions, the rest of the world isn't doing enough to keep North Korea in line. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Washington. The Syrian city hit by a deadly gas attack a few weeks ago was pounded again today, this time with conventional weapons killing at least a dozen people. Idlib ha now has no functioning hospital after being hit by either Russian or Syrian government planes. President Bashar al-Assad continues to target the already devastated city, even after the U.S. missile strike against Syria prompted by that previous chemical attack. The specter of Russian hackers now looms over Paris as well as Washington. Online security company Trend Micro says French presidential candidate Emmanuel Macron is being attacked online with phishing emails and malware based in Russia. The Russians deny any involvement. French citizens will vote again in less than two weeks. One of Canada's biggest insurance companies is slashing its workforce. More than one in ten staff will lose their job. The biggest impacts will be felt in London, Ontario and Winnipeg. Cameron McIntosh has more on the cuts and the reason for them. They got word right after the company's investors did. Not surprisingly, outside of Great West Life's Winnipeg head office, few were interested in talking. Hi, right, pardon me. May we ask you about the analysis? Excuse see some guys. Sorry. Great West Life Co. is the insurance arm of Montreal-based Power Financial Group, which holds a majority stake. With $1.2 trillion in assets, it serves 13 million clients in Canada and has subsidiaries in the U.S., Europe and Asia. Last quarter, it announced dividends. While it's consistently tapped as one of Canada's top employers, it now says it needs to shed 13% of its Canadian staff, 1,500 people, nearly a third here in Winnipeg in a move its CEO says is being driven by technological change. Not only are customers demanding greater digital and mobile access to financial services, they are becoming increasingly cost sensitive. It's not unlike recent moves by many of the big banks, trading staff for new technology as client interaction moves to the internet and smartphone apps. And I think that's part of a continuing trend that we're seeing right across the economy, but that has been especially pronounced in the service industry and within the service industry, especially in the financial sector. In a city with few large corporate players, 450 jobs will be a hit, particularly after another local heavyweight, Crown-owned Manitoba Hydro, announced it's cutting 900 jobs. Manitoba's premier, a financial consultant himself, says while the cuts hurt, he's taking a longer view. This is a company that has been employing tens of thousands of Manitobans for a long period of time, Canadians too, uh, for a long time, and that it's making decisions it feels are necessary uh, to compete and to sustain its services for its clients. While Great West says it's adapting to client needs, it also says its job cuts will be a mix of both severances and early retirements that will play out over the next couple of years. In the meantime, the company's stock closed slightly up today. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, 
Winnipeg. Straight ahead, medical experts set the record straight about saturated fats and the impact on your health. Stay with us. Earth Day has been organized from this office by young people using all the enthusiasm and techniques of publicity which were developed by the peace movement. They have been joined by many politicians, for no one opposes in principle a clean environment. On Earth Day, we're going to be focusing the whole society's concerns upon the broad range of environmental issues that are coming up to the whole series of ways that we are destroying the world that, that some of us really want to live in 30 years from now. All we are saying is give us the chance. They gathered in thousands here and tens of thousands there, but in our 136 countries, there were 200 million, the organizers said. But who could possibly count? In Europe, they bicycled. In Central America, they rallied. On Parliament Hill, there was a message from the man who wrote, Never Cry Wolf. With the help of the Wolf Pack, I want you to pick up that message and bounce it off this building behind me. Now, let's go! Arr! There may have been snow in the forecast and a cold wind blowing, but the drums were hot in Ottawa, even if the crowd was smaller than expected. No, there's a lot of issues that forcing this thing maybe to the back seat, but I don't know, I still think it's pretty strong. In Montreal, there was a march through the city. It's important to remember people, we are losing our hearth now. In Toronto, hundreds took part in an Earth Day march, walking from Queen's Park to Toronto City Hall. Here too, organizers admit the fight to clean up the planet is not easy, but it must be done. Although the environment is under great stress, we at least can show some hope. Earth Day sucks. There, I said it. Earth Day sucks. He's not alone. There's a growing group online. It's not the message. That, Norman says, is good, especially when it involves educating the young about the mess their parents have left the planet in. Now he sees corporations using Earth Day to sell stuff, and he doesn't pull punches. Earth Day should be every day. This one day per year stuff is garbage. All we are saying is give us a chance. Taking public transit may be touted as helping the environment, but a new study suggests the air quality on Toronto, subway trains and stations, rivals a smoggy day in Beijing. The research finds air pollution on Toronto's underground system is roughly 10 times higher than at street level, worse than Vancouver's SkyTrain and Montreal's Metro. Researchers say Toronto's high reading is likely due to wheels rubbing on the rails, producing metal-heavy particulates. When it comes to nutrition, saturated fat has been widely labeled as public enemy number one, a potential killer. But is it really as bad as that? A new medical review from Britain aims to turn conventional thinking on its head. Christine Birak has more. Because it's best for cutting down saturated fats in the diet. Leading doctors and scientists have already admitted they got it wrong. Saturated fats are not clogging up our arteries, causing heart attacks and stroke. But a new editorial says too many of us still think it. Which is wrong. In, in my view, this has actually contributed to the epidemics of type 2 diabetes, obesity and continuing epidemic of heart disease. Experts say the real problem is that our arteries, the highways going in and out of the heart, are being damaged, which leads to inflammation or swelling, shutting down lanes, reducing blood flow to your heart, which in extreme cases leads to heart attacks or stroke. So what drives that? Well, obviously foods that are high in you know, refined carbohydrates, such as too much bread, too much pasta, too much rice, too much sugar, all these foods in excess will drive insulin resistance. So what's insulin resistance? When there's glucose or sugar rushing through your blood, it's insulin's job to get it out. But when there's too much sugar, our cells begin to resist insulin and don't let the sugar in, leaving it in the bloodstream, damaging your arteries and causing inflammation. If we can get rid of inflammation, 
and insulin resistance, and we can lower uh, cholesterol in the blood, we can make a huge impact on public health. Ross Durant learned saturated fats aren't the enemy the hard way. He has type 2 diabetes and suffered a heart attack five years ago. He now exercises five days a week and eats a more balanced diet. I eat butter. I understand butter's not a cheat anymore. And, but I had some great arguments uh, with very nice people. And as long as those arguments or misunderstandings over saturated fats continue, experts say the situation only gets worse because young people now are less active and eating more processed food than ever before. Christine Burak, CBC News, Toronto. The herd of 16 bison introduced into Banff National Park earlier this year has grown in size by three. This calf was the first born in the park in over 140 years, and two more have been born since the weekend. Bison were introduced into Banff in February as part of Canada 150 celebrations. And conservationists in Kenya hope this critically endangered fellow will become a father. Sudan is the world's last male white northern rhino. His human protector set up this tongue-in-cheek Tinder profile today to raise money for a breeding program, and so many people swiped right to help out, the site crashed. Still to come in the program, Becca's story. How a dying teen's call for kindness went viral. That's next on The National. We just gave the blah, blah, blah. This is Roger Tetro. He's a Montreal bill collector. That's his job. He also holds news conferences. That's his hobby. Here's Tetro three years ago, posing as the president of a fictional group called Water Aid for America, urging that Canada ship its water to the drought-stricken U.S. The national media gobbled it up. Here is the CBC News. A group of Montreal residents wants to pressure the Canadian government into diverting water from the Great Lakes into the Mississippi River. The French language network of the CBC believed Tetro was also a nuclear expert. Here he is telling a national audience how the Chernobyl disaster could rain down assorted horrors on North Americans. The now defunct Montreal Daily News had him under another name, Tubal Kane, and yet another vocation. It's been going on for years. In 1971, the Montreal Star thought it had a scoop an internal CIA memo outlining covert operations in Quebec. It even made The National on CBC. Under a CIA letterhead, the document reads, Subject, Quebec. It was Tetro's work, of course. Around the same time, he suckered the Toronto Star Weekly with a phony FLQ terrorist camp in the Laurentian Hills. I told myself, if they want fiction, I'll give them fiction. So I gave them fiction. Tetro says there are many others like him. Only nowadays, they're known as media consultants and spin doctors. Whoever's uh, got an axe to grind, they give their spin to it, and they get into the media, and uh, that's the story that goes out. He's absolutely right. Uh, governments, uh, anybody who's covered governments or followed things they do, uh, know that they uh, engage in this, where you want to call them trial balloons or disinformation, uh, they do it frequently. Is Tetro's career as a hoaxer over? perhaps, but he says he'll certainly keep trying, guided by the firm belief that there's a reporter born every minute. He mouthed two words, the first word of which uh, started with F and the second word of which started with O. Well, it, it's a lie because I didn't say anything. Did you, well, sir, did did you mouth it? it? What does mouth mean? You move, move your lips? Move your lips. Yes, I move my lips. And the words you've been quoted is saying? No. Did you well, to get what, what, did you what were you lips? thinking? when you moved your lips. What is the nature of your thoughts, gentlemen, when you say fuddle-duddle or something like that? God, you... Well, the big topic on Parliament Hill today wasn't the Constitution, it wasn't the economy, it was the Prime Minister and his language. I heard him say very clearly, f***ing bastard. I convey to the Speaker uh, my regrets for any inconvenience, and I convey to any honourable member of the House uh, my regrets to them. Just... Quieten down, baby. <laughs> Liberal Sheila Copps didn't think the remark was very funny. Baby. I'm not his baby, and I'm nobody's baby, and I'd like him to withdraw those remarks. The House is no stranger to heated exchanges, but few have been this heated or this strange. Is he? Or shame. Now, 
I hear the word racist from that side. Do you have the fortitude or the gonads to stand up and come across here and say that to me, you son of a bitch? Come on. Harder. Harder. Stinson came within three meters of liberal John Cannis before returning to his seat. It was too much for one liberal MP. I did not say fuddle duddle, that was another generation. I, I, I think that we've reached a point where this type of uh, conduct, it's not only disgraceful, but it's unacceptable. Kindness and positivity, they're a choice, and it's a choice you make every day. She's just 17 years old and dying of cancer. But Rebecca Schofield is larger than life. The New Brunswick teenager has already had a huge impact in her community and beyond. Just because she wanted to make the world a better place, kinder, with more goodwill. And boy, has she succeeded, proving along the way that what you give in life and off is often what you get in return. Here's Tom Murphy with more on Becca's mission. Hands, put your empty hands in my all I'm going to say is Rebecca Schofield. It started as a simple wish, so very simple. Just do an act of kindness, pay it forward. We really like Becca's dream. Let's complete it as a team. I heard a story about this young woman in Riverview, New Brunswick. There's been a lot of shares on Facebook, pretty much everywhere in the community. We put a benefit on and raise $2,100. I'm going to donate uh, $200. We are donating $200 today to all of our guests. I just got back from paying it forward here at the local Tim Hortons in winter. I'm about to go deliver a check for $400. And I did this because Becca told me to. Becca told me to! Because Becca told us to. Yay! It's grown into a kind of movement no one could have imagined. All because of this girl, Becca Schofield. What have you learned about people in all of this? We've always known that, that people have this kindness within them, but I've learned that it's, it's a lot easier than you would think for people to embrace the message and it's it's a lot easier to teach kindness than it is to teach hate becca is 17 years old she has brain cancer the call for kindness was a way becca wanted people to help her celebrate her last round of radiation treatment It became a sensation with its own hashtag, Becca told me to. Even the Prime Minister took note of Becca's kindness movement in a tweet. And when Becca's wish to take a train to Quebec City and later Toronto for a Leafs game came true recently, people throughout small town New Brunswick lined the tracks to celebrate her and her simple idea, just be kind. The brain cancer zaps her energy, makes it difficult to walk without support from her mother, Anne. Most outings, Becca needs a wheelchair. It's no big deal. Just a few weeks ago, she was a patient in this Moncton hospital, suffering with severe dehydration caused by vomiting. I guess I should, I should put my glasses on. See that bucket? It never leaves her side. 
Jeff. Hi, Jeff is one of the owners of the, of the Gojis that did the fundraising. There you go. I think it'll fit you. Hey. Okay. We've had a few fundraisers from Becca Tolby too. This is one. This one is the largest so far. On this day, Becca is also on her own mission of kindness. A local business donated its profits for a day. Now she's paying it forward to the very unit where she's been a patient. And this is the ward where Becca spends far too much time. We thought we'd come show, you, show her to you when she's nice and healthy. Yeah, that's what I want to see. Everybody knows her here. You look She's great. You do. Look you do. Good. You're good. Um, the the train ride. There was a woman. Uh, what? Where was it? At? Uh, I think it was after Bathurst. There was yeah, yeah. a woman before she got off the train. She wanted to give it to Rebecca. It was her mother's. Oh, oh that's beautiful. It was her mother's, uh, and she really wanted to give it to Rebecca. Oh, so. I think that's so special. Kindness and positivity. They're a choice, and it's a it's not a choice you make once and then. It, it just comes easily. It's a choice you make every day. And to know that these people are making that choice daily over and over, and they're doing it because I have inspired them to do that, it's, it's fantastic. It's pretty good medicine, isn't it? Yeah. And here's the thing about an act of kindness. <laughs> Becca has learned it not only makes both the recipient and the giver feel good, but often that act of kindness comes full circle. Like on this day, Becca is at the New Brunswick Legislature. <laughs> an honored guest of the Speaker of the House with her mother, Father Darren, and sister Gabrielle. Please stand for the arrival of Mr. Speaker. Pray be seated. Members, I'm incredibly honored today to welcome a New Brunswicker who has inspired all of us. Rebecca Schofield's generosity of spirit is an example for and of all New Brunswickers. Please join me, members, in welcoming Becca and her loved ones to this legislative assembly. Chris Collins lost his own 13-year-old son to cancer. In Becca, he sees his son's courage. She has a huge heart, and uh, her love for people, her love for life, um, her, her strong social conscience, uh, these are all things that uh, I think are very special about her. Um, I liked the fact that it was basically we go in and get compliments until we leave. <laughs> I have a teenage daughter, and I'm trying to imagine what it's like as a parent going through this. How, can you help me understand? No, because I can't understand it either. <laughs> um, everybody has their, their own way of dealing with their journey. And this is the, like I keep referring to, like this is a conscious effort that we have done, that this is how we're going to deal with it. You, you just focus on the good days and you just breathe through the bad ones. Even the Irvings, one of the most powerful families in Canada, has been touched by Becca's movement. I'll say official hi when we get inside. <laughs> Staff here at their Moncton headquarters raised the most money ever in a casual day fundraiser. $3,000. The company topped it up to $5,000. I'm joined by an inspiring young woman, Rebecca Schofield. Let's show that spirit. That's right. Thank you for reminding us that one simple act of kindness can make a huge, huge difference. I just wanted to say thank you. This is awesome for so many reasons, but mainly because it means that my parents can still 
stay off of work and be home with me in the time that I have. You see, Becca is dying. Her brain tumors are inoperable. This kind, giving girl has been given just months to live. Big hug. Are you scared? What, what are you, what are you feeling? And I try not to let it sink in. I, sometimes I think about it a little too much and I do, I do get scared. It's, it's about a fear of the unknown. I get scared about dying. I get scared about living. <laughs> I get scared about, about people hearing this story and, and thinking negatively of me. I get scared of so many things, but I, like I say, positivity is a choice. When Becca found out last Christmas that she didn't have long to live, she put together a bucket list, things she wants to do before she dies. What's on a 17-year-old's bucket list? Well, remember that train ride to Toronto? That was on her bucket list. So was a night with the Toronto Maple Leafs. Just another, just another day. <laughs> just another day in the life. And one of the most difficult to arrange, yet one of the most treasured wishes, a final skate with her sister Gabrielle. <laughs> What is it you like about skating? I don't know, just like gliding, it makes me feel free. But as with all things with Becca, this will be no ordinary skate. She'll take to the ice with her favorite junior hockey players from the Moncton Wildcats. Yeah, like it's fading away, but what about your name right here? I heard, thank you. It's kind of fading away, but... Yeah, that means a lot, thank you. And they've arranged for this special device to help this teenager who can barely walk feel the freedom of skating once more. This is not what skating <laughs> used to be like. like. What it used to be. <laughs> no. Years ago, Becca and her sister Gabrielle played ringette, which is why she so desperately wanted to skate with her again. But before she knew it, the skate turned into an impromptu ringette game with the Wildcats. You set the cheer. I think they have both goals in the same net, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <I thought>. really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> another day of making memories and checking another thing off the bucket list. They're trying to trip me. <laughs> I think that calls for a penalty. But there's more. The Wildcats have renamed their Community Spirit Award after Becca. Not only will she get to attend the award ceremony as a special guest, she will present the trophy named in her honor. Proof that one act of kindness really does lead to another. Tom Murphy, CBC News, Moncton. Today, Becca's mom told us she's doing well, and though she sleeps a lot, Becca's still crossing off items on her bucket list, including later this week a trip to a beach in Nova Scotia with her family. There's more to come in the program, including our latest viewpoint on Justin Trudeau's plan to extend parental leave. Let's check the day's business numbers now. The TSX saw a gain of 32 points, while the Canadian dollar dropped about a third of a cent. The Nasdaq saw another record high, closing up 41 points. The price of oil rose by 33 cents a barrel. Problems were removed when the Strangely, radio tape also plays a vital part in the television newscast. A reporter working on a story may not always be able to gather together all his facts in time to film a report. To overcome this, he will direct the shooting of silent film to illustrate the story and will later record his own voice track on ordinary broadcast tape. ...the subject of a motion by Councillor John Parker. Cal, 
this bit with Borgo about the uh, reaction, differing reaction between French Canadians and English Canadians. The radio and television newsrooms work closely on many stories. Sound from a film is often re-recorded for radio broadcast use, and conversely, radio tapes frequently are used to provide commentary for a particular piece of film. I think personally that um, uh, General de Gaulle has a good foreign policy most of the time, uh, as most Frenchmen agree on. As you get some the uh, contrasting action from the French Canadians on one side and the English Canadians on the other. Uh, All right, well, we'll get that put on the desk and we can run that. One night that in the morning. Perhaps over some man in the street and we run about City Hall when the goal is here. That's about the picture. Okay, fine, thanks, Alan. <laughs> Out in the city, cameramen and reporters are following a fast-breaking news story. Which at any time can take an unpredictable turn. Two hours to go, and a motorcycle messenger arrives unexpectedly with some late film. Again, the lineup order is changed to permit the inclusion of this new item. Uh, Dickie, is that film from Quebec ready yet? Oh, not till then, eh? Well, I can't wait. Okay, bye-bye. The final splice is made in the film. It is cleaned and wound onto the reel. That Austrian balloon team is going to take another trip on Friday. Many people express surprise at learning that a newscast for television is rehearsed. The reason for this is that each program must begin and end on a precise second. Because of this, every item must be timed and the duration of each film checked under actual studio conditions to provide an accurate count. The announcer can familiarize himself with the script. Last minute changes can be made, a word deleted or added to improve the sense, and material eliminated to ensure perfect timing. Even so, the rehearsal provides nothing like the preparation of other types of television programs. My name is Rabina Ahmad Haq. I'm a personal finance columnist. I want to talk to you about the Trudeau government's empty promise to help women in the workplace. In the last federal budget, the government announced it's extending job-protected parental leave from 12 to 18 months. Now moms and dads who want to be away from work longer with their new baby can do so with employment security. Even though parental leave benefits are available to both parents, mothers compared to fathers are much more likely to take time off after having a baby. This move definitely sounds progressive for women, especially coming from Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, who says he will never shy away from calling himself a feminist and says the time has come for women to take an equal place to men in the workplace. But here's the problem with this new extended parental leave. There's no extra money in it. This is what the government is saying. We're going to take the current parental benefit provided over 12 months and spread it ever so thinly over an additional six months. Women now make up almost 50% of the workforce, and Trudeau claims to want policy in place that supports that. But this announcement is nothing more than progressive posturing. It's a move to make women feel like our government really cares about our family and our work life without actually doing anything at all. Put it this way, right now the maximum you can receive in benefits over a year is $543 per week. Even if you receive the maximum amount over 18 months, 
your weekly benefit drops to $325. Who can live on that with a baby? For a woman to afford an 18-month maternity leave, she would have to have a partner who can financially support her through those months, a lot of money in the bank, or a fantastic benefit plan at work that tops up her pay. This immediately leaves out single mothers who don't have savings, married mothers in low-income households, and young moms who haven't had time to even land a full-time job. As it is, some women can't afford to be away from work for 12 months, even if they have a job guaranteed to come back to. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, if you really want to help women who choose to take time away to have kids, do something that will actually make a difference to the day-to-day -day lives of mothers. First, don't just extend parental leave. At the very least, extend the benefits. Add more money. And then go a step further and develop a plan for a countrywide universal childcare program. Make it so it can start as early as women need it to. Any mother of young kids will tell you that would work because it would mean they can afford to make choices that are right for them. Stay home, attend school, or go back to work. You know, the same choices men have when they become fathers. For The National, I'm Rubina Ahmed Huck. I'm Anna Maria Tremonti. Tomorrow on The Current, feminist Camille Paglia says gender freedom means allowing each sex to define its history and destiny without blame or harassment. Camille Paglia on The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1. the oldest camera in the world. And this, the oldest existing photograph, taken in 1826. Then in 1851, a new process came along. A glass plate had to be meticulously cleaned. It was then coated with collodion to form a thin, even film on the glass. It was a cumbersome method, but the glass gave clear, sharp negatives and unlimited prints on paper. With me now is the promotion manager for a black <coughs> camera chain. This is the uh, Kodak uh, Instamatic. You just simply flip the back like so, open it up, mm -hmm. and I'll let you take it from there. I there will now a... play the part of the child. If I can okay. operate a child can, and that will show you how easy it all is to I do. Knew, I knew if I said that it would come out backwards, and it did. <laughs> <laughs> now that's the roll of film. Just to... it, turn it around, and zap You want to take an indoor picture? Yes, you I pop do. pop on a cube? Yes, a cube. Now, and then I just, just push, push that the and button. I got a picture. That's it. All right, stand back, everybody. Nope. Well, hey, feature. folks, it works. One of the keys to taking good pictures is the size of your film. The larger the negative, the better chance you'll get sharp results. That's the knock against the disc cameras. They're easy to use and inexpensive. But if you plan to get any of your pictures enlarged, the tiny negatives in disc film are a real liability. This new film method comes complete with its own lens and shutter. It slips easily into a pocket and it can be developed in the usual way. Until now, camera companies were in a race to produce the most portable and the cheapest of the instant filmless cameras. And the announcement by the Japanese Fuji Group is a major leap forward. This is one you hook to your computer. Looks like a telephone. It's a camera that will hold 32 images in electronic memory. Then you can transfer them to your computer. Can you take my picture with this? I'd be, All right. be glad to. All right. All right. Ready? <coughs> smile for the computer. S smile for the computer. Ready? One, two, three. And Good. once they're in the computer, can you print them on your printer? You can print, a, print them on your printer. You can uh, put them, say, into a publishing program if you want to include them in a newsletter. Ooh, this is exciting. I look pretty darn stupid there. I mean, we, how much is this job? Th this one's $800. Okay. Modern photographers can work with precision because of the technical advances of the late 19th century. But the mystery and magic of photography remains in the way silver crystals gather together after being exposed to light.
Since Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte launched his drug war, thousands of people in his country have been killed. Thousands more have been thrown into filthy, overcrowded jails, sometimes for years without trial or even charges. The Quezon Jail is one such place, built to hold 800 people. Some 2,600 prisoners live there. Our Adrian Arsenault visited Quezon last month, and she found more than just misery inside. Thank you. get killed if you were outside? I think so. So they're going to do their, um, it's the exercise time now? So these prisoners start every morning with these exercises and a song and dance that they've apparently developed themselves. But the prison says every time visitors come, they ask them to do it again. So because we're here, here they go. to present to you the pride of Castle City Jail, the Galau Galau Sing and Dance Crew. The singing dance was intended for exercise because the attitude towards exercise is really negative. So we packaged the exercise as a singing dance so that everyone will be enticed to do it. They've started practicing it every day. And the song, the lyrics of the song, it's all about the life in jail. So they, they all can relate with the song and the dance. We are doing something to the inmates, despite uh, what's happening outside in the drug war. So we're really making an effort to do something. Wow. Adrian gathered several stories while she was in the Philippines, and we'll have another one of them for you tomorrow. I'm Adrian Arsenault in Manila. The phenomenon of fake news and online attacks here makes the North American version look almost quaint. The effects can sometimes be devastating. The truth getting lost in a sea of salacious lies. We watched her online get stripped of her dignity. The online political influencers here are like few others, fiercely loyal to the president and challengers to their narrative, beware. Yeah, what of the big drug lords? For now, she is the number one. And I'm sticking to that. You're sticking to that. Fake news and real threats in the Philippines, tomorrow on The National. That's The National for this Tuesday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Diana Swain. Thanks for watching.